and welcome back to room 303 in sophomore English and we continue now in our study of unit 6 by looking at some of the oldest stories on the planet and one of those from the Sunjata we're about to, to look at here uh, I'm with you on page 1091 and following we'll um, meet um, DT Nayan here in a second and uh, the, the Sunjata. Before we get there though, at 2B, just write this down. I know we've been talking about this since our freshman year. The epic and the epic hero. The epic again, make sure you have a definition, an extended narrative poem about the deeds of heroes. And of course the epic hero is a warrior. His character may be based on a historic or a legendary figure. In a number of epics the hero strives to win immortality or dying fame through, or, or undying fame through great deeds, especially in combat. The typical epic hero has at least three characteristics. Make sure these are in your notes at 2B. One, he has a high position in society and the virtues of a warrior such as strength, courage, perseverance. Two, he defends his family's honor. He behaves ethically, fighting evil and striving for justice. Three, he may be marked by the gods or by fate, and so may benefit from special blessings or suffer from special burdens. An epic often reflects the culture that created it, celebrating the cultural values and reinforcing its ideals. We'll say this again when we study together as seniors, the Anglo-Saxon poem Beowulf. It's like a national song. It tells us what the culture really um, concerns itself with. Uh, we'll also, in our reading skill on uh, 1091, want to analyze cultural context. Uh, this is obviously very important in a story like this from Molly. Let's uh, pay attention to the vocabulary on 1092. Um, uh, let's uh, go ahead and, and on page 1093, meet D.T. Nyan, born in 1932. Um, Sunjata's people, I'm just reading with you, the Malinki, um, are one of the uh, Mandi's people of West Africa. So write this down. That's where this one comes from, West Africa. Mandi society is divided into three different classes of people, from nobles to commoners. In his day, Sunjata's people traded in gold. After his victory over Sumarjuru, uh, Sunjatu, uh, uh, um, uh, Sunjati um, uh, conquered neighboring lands and built an extensive kingdom known as the Mali Empire. Um, the Girok tradition. Sunjatu um, achievements were celebrated over the centuries by West African oral historians known as Girots. Uh, the 20th century Girot um, continued this tradition in Kayuti. I derive, quote unquote, I derive my knowledge from my father, Jelly Keaton, who also got it from his father, um, Koyeti will explain. Uh, history holds no mystery for us, the scholar uh, D.T. Nyan will write uh, um, as an account of Sun, uh, Sunjate uh, and based on um, Koyeti's retellings. Um, Koyeti belongs to the same clan as the kings of Old Mali. The background for this epic uh, the Su, uh, Sunjata um, tells the story of Mari, um, um, also known as Sunjata. Nearly 1,000 years ago, a warrior named Sumarjuru took control of the area around Mali in West Africa and oppressed its Malikan people. A hero arose to unite the people, defeat, defeat uh, Samajuru, and usher in a period of peace. That hero was Sunjata. So uh, we'll want to now pay attention in this cutting. This excerpt, this is not obviously the entire epic, this excerpt begins the story of an unlikely hero, a tech-turned boy with a huge head who cannot stand upright. And uh, this story tells how Mari overcomes his infirmity and regains his honor in an exciting and instructive tale based on true events. You'll have your characters there listed for you on 1095. Let's go to work. Notice that this cutting is divided up into parts. Do you see it? We've got childhood on page 1095. Then we have the lion's awakening on 1099. Um, and, that will, uh, and that will then um, take us to the end of the reading. So put at level one both of those, childhood, um, the first one, skip a few lines and then the lion's awakening. And obviously we want to pause at level one and we want to make sure that we know exactly what's happening in the story at level one. All right, let's pay attention now. Sit up, conquer monkey mind, and let's go to work with this text. See how well we do, all right? From Sanjata, an epic of Old Mali, by D.T. Nyan. Childhood. God has his mysteries which none can fathom. You, perhaps, will be a king. You can do nothing about it. You, on the other hand, will be unlucky. 
but you can do nothing about that either. Each man finds his way already marked out for him, and he can change nothing of it. Fate, right? Fate. So Valone's son had a slow and difficult childhood. At the age of three, he still crawled along on all fours while children of the same age were already walking. He had nothing of the great beauty of his father, Nare Magan. He had a head so big that he seemed unable to support it. He also had large eyes which would open wide whenever anyone entered his mother's house. He was taciturn and used to spend the whole day just sitting in the middle of the house. Whenever his mother went out, he would crawl on all fours to rummage about in the calabashes in search of food, for he was very greedy. Malicious tongues began to laugh. What three-year-old has not yet taken his first steps? What three-year-old is not the despair of his parents through his whims and shifts of mood? What three-year-old is not the joy of his circle through his backwardness in talking? So the lone jata, for it was thus that they called him, prefixing his mother's name to his. So Balun Jata, then, was very different from others of his own age. He spoke little, and his severe face never relaxed into a smile. You would have thought that he was already thinking, and what amused children of his age bored him. Often, Sobalon would make some of them come to him to keep him company. These children were already walking, and she hoped that Jata, seeing his companions walking, would be tempted to do likewise. But nothing came of it. Besides, Sobalon Jata would brain the poor little things with his already strong arms, and none of them would come near him anymore. All right, let's pause for a second and just pay attention now at level one, introduction to a story. Notice it begins with a little bit of a statement about fate. There's so much about your life you cannot choose. You didn't choose the color of your eyes, etc., etc., etc. Notice that Sogolon is going to be born challenged, reminding you already at 3A of our Blackfeet story, that is to say Long Arrow. Same gig, right? In other words, both of these stories will start out with a young person who is marginalized, made fun of, usually has some kind of physical attribute that's going to be open for, you know, laughing at. And of course these stories have a very ancient motif, the, 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 the motif of the ugly duckling story, you know the Rudolph the Red-Nosed reindeer, reindeer story, everyone of course ridiculing a certain kind of problem with Rudolph and ultimately Rudolph is able, with, this is a very, very ancient archetype, so write that down at level 2B, an archetype. The hero starts out challenged in some way, made fun of in some way. Nobody is predicting that this is going to be ultimately the hero of all heroes. By the way, just think about this. In American tradition, we have this kind of story. In, for example, the story of, uh, uh, of the great Abraham Lincoln, who started out, for example, living with very, very little, living uh, in, you know, in poverty, and then ascended to greatness. So this is a very old notion that it's going to start out bad, but it's going to end up heroic. All right, here we go. Let's go ahead and now pay attention at level one. Just enjoy the story. The king's first wife was the first to rejoice at Sogolon Jata's infirmity. Her own son, Dankaran Tuman, was already eleven. He was a fine and lively boy who spent the day running about the village with those of his own age. He had even begun his initiation in the bush. The king had had a bow made for him, and he used to go behind the town to practice archery with his companions. Sasuma was quite happy and snapped her fingers at Sogolon, whose child was still crawling on the ground. Whenever the latter happened to pass by her house, she would say, Come, my son, walk, jump, leap about. The jinn didn't promise you anything out of the ordinary, but I prefer a son who walks on his two legs to a lion that crawls on the ground. She spoke thus whenever Sobolon went by her door. The innuendo would go straight home, and then she would burst into laughter, that diabolical laughter which a jealous woman knows how to use so well. Her son's infirmity weighed heavily upon Sogolon Kiju. She had resorted to all her talent as a sorceress to give strength to her son's legs. But the rarest herbs had been useless. The king himself lost hope. How impatient man is. Key line, right? Nare Magan became imperceptibly estranged, but Nankoman Dua never ceased reminding him of the hunter's words. Sogolon became pregnant again. The king hoped for a son, but it was a daughter called Kalonkin. 
She resembled her mother and had nothing of her father's beauty. 1097. The disheartened king debarred Sobalone from his house, and she lived in semi-disgrace for a while. Nare Magan married the daughter of one of his allies, the king of the Kamaras. She was called Nomanji, and her beauty was legendary. A year later, she brought a boy into the world. When the king consulted soothsayers on the destiny of this son, he received the reply that Nemanji's child would be the right hand of some mighty king. The king gave the newly born the name of Bukhari. He was to be called Manding Bukhari, or Manding Buri, later on. Nari Magan was very perplexed. Could it be that the stiff-jointed son of Sogolon was the one the hunter soothsayer had foretold? The Almighty has his mysteries, Nankuman Dua would say, and taking up the hunter's words, added, the silk cotton tree emerges from a tiny seed. Nice line, right? One day, Nari Magan came along to the house of Nunfairi, the blacksmith seer of Niani. He was an old blind man. He received the king in the anteroom, which served as his workshop. To the king's question, he replied, when the seed germinates, growth is not always easy. Great trees grow slowly, but they plunge their roots deep into the ground. Pause for a moment, write it down at 3a. Of course, this old blind man who tells you something important, we saw this, didn't we, in our study of Antigone. This is the Tiresias character, and we have these also in stories and in mythology. By the way, notice that the old blind man will tell us something about seeds germinating and great trees growing slowly as their roots go deep into the ground. In other words, put this in 2A, one of the central teachings of the story is patience. Patience. It takes us back at 3A to, of course, Psalm of Life. Let us then be up and doing with a heart for any fate, still achieving, still pursuing, learn to labor and to wait. We've got to have patience. Great things don't happen over time which every sophomore has to learn the hard way. We're only halfway through high school by the end of this year, right? But has the seed really germinated? said the king. Of course, replied the blind seer. Only the growth is not as quick as you would like it. How impatient man is. This interview and Dua's confidence gave the king some assurance to the great displeasure of Sasuma Berite, the king restored Sogalon to favor, and soon another daughter was born to her. She was given the name of Jamaru. However, all Niani talked of nothing else but the stiff-legged son of Sogalon. He was now seven, and he still crawled to get about. In spite of all the king's affection, Sogalon was in despair. Nare Magan aged, and he felt his time coming to an end. Dankaran Tuman, the son of Sasuma Berite, was now a fine youth. One day, Nare Magan made Mari Jata come to him, and he spoke to the child as one speaks to an adult. Mari Jata, I am growing old, and soon I shall be no more among you. But before death takes me off, I am going to give you the present each king gives his successor. In Mali, every prince has his own griot. Dua's father was my father's griot. Dua is mine, and the son of Dua, Bala Fasica, here will be your griot. Be inseparable friends from this day forward. 1099. From his mouth, you will hear the history of your ancestors. You will learn the art of governing Mali according to the principles which our ancestors have bequeathed to us. Stories, right? Stories. I have served my term, and done my duty too. I have done everything which a king of Mali ought to do. I am handing an enlarged kingdom over to you, and I leave you sure allies. May your destiny be accomplished, but never forget that Niani is your capital, and Mali the cradle of your ancestors. The child, as if he had understood the whole meaning of the king's words, beckoned Balafasika to approach. He made room for him on the hide he was sitting on, and then said, Bala, 
you will be my griot. Yes, son of Sobolon, if it pleases God, replied Bala Faseca. The king and Dua exchanged glances that radiated confidence. All right, so let's pause for a moment. This is, again, very, very old motif. Two things. One, you have to have the old man who says to the young man, of course, Marijata is going to be the hero of our story here, right? Says to the young man, you're the one. You're the one that has to take care of this. By the way, for those of you who are Matrix fans, you know all about Neo being kind of the one that's called out. It's a very, very old kind of story. For our Star Wars fans in the house, this is Luke Skywalker. This is a very, very old motif. We're talking now at 3A, aren't we? And all the titles that come to mind. Uh, number two, every hero's got to have a sidekick. Every hero's got to have a pal. Every hero's got to have somebody who's going to be there. And so you've got to have union. Let's write that down as, as, as a message at 2A. You've got to have union. You've got to have that notion of we're all in this together. You've got to have somebody that goes along with you. If you'll think about it, you've got to have Batman and Robin. Do you got me? In other words, this is that old motif. It's a very, very ancient archetype. You're never alone as long as you have somebody else there with you. All right, let's go to the second now, the Lion's Awakening, the second section of our story here, and continue. The Lion's Awakening. A short while after this interview between Nari Magan and his son, the king died. Sugalon's son was no more than seven years old. The Council of Elders met in the king's palace. It was no use to us defending the king's will, which reserved the throne for Marijata for the council took no account of Nari Magan's wish. With the help of Sasuma Barite's intrigues, Dankaran Tuman was proclaimed king, and a regency council was formed in which the queen mother was all-powerful. A short time after, Dua died. As men have short memories, Sogolon's son was spoken of with nothing but irony and scorn. People had seen one-eyed kings, one-armed kings and lame kings, but a stiff-legged king had never been heard tell of. No matter how great the destiny promised for Marijata might be, the throne could not be given to someone who had no power in his legs. If the jinn loved him, let them begin by giving him the use of his legs. Such were the remarks that Sobolon heard every day. The queen mother, Sasuma Berite, was the source of all this gossip. Gotta have a villain, right? Having become all-powerful, Sasuma Berite persecuted Sobolon because the late Nari Magan had preferred her. She banished Sobolon and her son to a backyard of the palace. Marijata's mother now occupied an old hut which had served as a lumber room of Sasuma's. The wicked queen mother allowed free passage to all those inquisitive people who wanted to see the child that still crawled at the age of seven. Nearly all the inhabitants of Niani filed into the palace, and the poor Sobolon wept to see herself thus given over to public ridicule. Marijata took on a ferocious look in front of the crowd of sightseers. Sobolon found a little consolation only in the love of her eldest daughter, Kolonka. She was four and she could walk. She seemed to understand all her mother's miseries, and already she helped her with the housework. Sometimes, when Sogolon was attending to the chores, it was she who stayed beside her sister, Jamaru, quite small as yet. Sogolon Kedju and her children lived on the queen mother's leftovers, but she kept a little garden in the open ground behind the village. It was there that she passed her brightest moments looking after her onions and nugus. One day, she happened to be short of condiments and went to the queen mother to beg a little baobab leaf. Look you, said the malicious Sasuma, I have a calabash full. Help yourself, you poor woman. As for me, my son knew how to walk at seven, and it was he who went and picked these baobab leaves. Take them then, since your son is unequal to mine. Then she laughed derisively with that fierce laughter which cuts through your flesh and penetrates right to the bone. So Galon Keju was dumbfounded. She had never imagined that hate could be so strong in a human being. Right? With a lump in her throat, she left Sasuma's. Outside her hut, Marijata, sitting on his useless legs, was blandly eating out of a calabash. Unable to contain herself any longer, 
So Galon burst into sobs and seizing a piece of wood, hit her son. She's ashamed, right? Oh, son of misfortune, will you never walk? Through your fault, I have just suffered the greatest affront of my life. What have I done, God, for you to punish me in this way? Marijata seized the piece of wood and looking at his mother said, Mother, what's the matter? Shut up. Nothing can ever wash me clean of this insult. But what then? Sasuma has just humiliated me over a matter of a baobab leaf. At your age, her own son could walk and used to bring his mother baobab leaves. Cheer up, mother. Cheer up. 11.01. No, it's too much. I can't. Very well, then. I am going to walk today, said Marijata. Go and tell my father Smith's to make me the heaviest possible iron rod. Mother, do you want just the leaves of the baobab, or would you rather I brought you the whole tree? Ah, my son, to wipe out this insult, I want the tree and its roots at my feet outside my hut. Balafaseka, who was present, ran to the master smith, Farakuru, to order an iron rod. So Malone had sat down in front of her hut. She was weeping softly and holding her head between her two hands. Marijata went calmly back to his calabash of rice and began eating again as if nothing had happened. From time to time, he looked up discreetly at his mother, who was murmuring in a low voice, I want the whole tree in front of my heart, the whole tree. All of a sudden, a voice burst into laughter behind the hut. It was the wicked Susuma telling one of her serving women about the scene of humiliation, and she was laughing loudly so that Sobolon could hear. Sobolon fled into the hut and hid her face under the blankets so as not to have before her eyes this heat 